Okay. Well, we are uh, we're in Belleville, Illinois. That's just across the river from the Great Arch of downtown St. Louis. Uh, and the plant is about uh, where we build the microphones is about four miles north of here in Fairview Heights, Illinois. And what I love to do is to spend time trying to bring things to you that normally we don't hear or read about. And it's really sad. <clears throat> Let me uh, get the right screen up <clears throat> because there, there are so many things that we all need to know and it's not happening. Even the manufacturers and their manuals are terrible. And uh, I, I really love bringing some of this great technology to everybody. And uh, I'm gonna do a little short history of where I came from. And uh, this is always kind of kind of fun to do, take a few minutes. And uh, we, we really started for me in 1956 with my Harvey Wells. <laughs> it's still on the air, by the way. It's uh, uh, right down the, you can see it right there. Every morning I'm on the air with, uh, my, with my Harvey Wells and well, we have a lot of fun on AM. But the station grew pretty quick. Um, it really has become my college education. And I really mean that. I learned so much. And it, it was one of those things that shortly after I was on the air, I mean, maybe two weeks, uh, I, I heard this station, K0DGE. I, I couldn't hardly make him out, though. It was horribly distorted. Now, I was a technician for 17 years. The reason was six meters, two meters, it was wide open all the time. I could... Uh, Get, get up at two in the morning or whenever, and it was still open. Uh, boy, could we uh, have those today? I'd love it. And six meters was like 75 meters. There were lots of conversations. There were a lot of how-tos, uh, technical things we talked about. Not today. Six meters has been totally ruined. Uh, FT8 and uh, uh, grid squares have ruined six meters. And you're probably saying, what, what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about it's ruined. Uh, it's all, you make a contact and all they want to know is your grid square and they're off to the races because they might miss a grid square. It's terrible. I hear this guy, terrible signal. And I, uh, I came back to him and uh, he was amazed. He said, nobody will come back to me. They can't understand me. Well, I had hit the BFO button on the Halicrafter 99. I didn't even know what it was. I've been on the air two weeks. What happened K0 DGE was on six meter sideband. And I learned later on, he was one of four or five. It hadn't happened yet. Heck, it wasn't even that popular on, uh, on 20 meters. So uh, I was at that time, I was playing the organ at the Fox Theater in St. Louis. I started there at the age of 15. And uh, I had time in between the shows. He said, well, come and, uh, come and visit me. And I did. And bingo, he was the chief engineer at KMOX Radio of CBS in St. Louis. And I, I was just really fascinated. I said, would you build me one of those sideband rigs? Nope, I can't do that, but I'll teach you how. And he did. We started off building a central electronics 10B in a kit, but we didn't uh, use the 20 meter coil on the output. What we did there, as we wound a coil for six meters, taught me how to use a grid dip meter and all that. Fascinating times. And um, we had to build an oscillator because uh, we were 14 megacycles. So how do you get to 50? He taught me how to build this little project here. It was a six U8 oscillator and 36 megs and 14 is 50. And the, I mean, the station just grew like crazy. In 59, uh, I built a, a kit uh, of Johnson six and two Thunderbolt that put about a quarter, a, a, a kilowatt and a quarter on the six and two meters. Fascinating stuff. You can see the central electronics above my head there that, that drove it all. So I was, I was fascinated by all of this. 
I also had these wonderful loving parents. Oh my goodness. They were, they were, they would just let me do whatever uh, because they knew I was learning things. And I was making a lot of money as a kid playing the organ professionally uh, at the age of 14, I started. And uh, so, you know, it was my money and all they had to do is make sure I didn't fall off the roof, <laughs> which I didn't had a lot of friends, <clears throat> uh, older friends, uh, the uh, Motorola dealer and so they had cranes and stuff and they helped me. The antenna I used was a spiral array. You'll notice it wasn't vertical and it wasn't horizontal. We're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. The fascinating antenna and, and really worked. I also took those down because I wanted to experiment with more phasing uh, with uh, Telerex's two meter. I had a 15 elements uh, vertical and 15 horizontal. And by switching in and out phasing lines in this down in the shack, I could do all kinds of things. Well, I get a call from Bob Drake in 1959. He said, are you the guy that's got that kilowatt on six meter sideband? And I said, yes, sir. He said, what well, we would like to invite you to our meeting. We hold an annual meeting once a year with uh, people that have technical things they can teach us. Well, it's at the Biltmore Hotel and they took all the furniture out of one room or out of one floor on oh, one room was Art Collins. The other one was Hallicrafters, uh, Bill Halligan, Wes Shum and the, and the uh, Central Electronics, Bob Drake. Uh, all these manufacturers were in these different rooms and you'd go in and out and in and out. Wow, what an amazing time for this kid. <clears throat> well, that was the Dayton Hamvention it was the beginning of it. It, it started off as a technical uh, project where they could have all of the guys in and all the manufacturers and teach us stuff. <clears throat> well, while I was there, I had a guy come to me, he was from England, and he said, we would like very much if you would help us with a project with your kilowatt sideband on two meters. And so why not? He sent over his 128 element array and away we get. I, I was, I just was a, a fanatic about all this stuff, especially antennas. But in those days, all of the rigs were high impedance. <clears throat> they, uh, they all had uh, usually crystals, very few dynamics, but they had this really wild peak around two, two five to three K, all of them, the D104 and the 444, and later on the high OHC fours and fives. Why, why is that? Why is that response not flat? Well, I, as many, I didn't understand this until one day, Paul Klipsch called me. He had heard about this Ohio Sound Company. By then we were building big monster PAs. And he said, I want to know <clears throat> what, what you were doing. I want to come and see you. And so he did. It was a fascinating time for me because we had built uh, several multi-kilowatt touring systems and nobody had been doing that. I didn't know it. Uh, those big speakers were Olsen horns that came out of the Fox Theater. They put in a new PA and they, they gave them to me. Well, bingo. This is just one side of that system. And we became a leading USA sound reinforcement company. We were doing all kinds of people. A top picture on the left, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Electrovoice people had started building that 30 inch for their patrician, which was a very, very cool uh, hi-fi speaker. And uh, I made a, a base amp out of it. I built the cabinet, one inch plywood and all that. Uh, what you see there was a mixer on top. That was one of my first products that I had started building. I didn't even have it finished in that picture as you can see. And yeah, that's me with the long hair. I didn't have to be with them because, uh, you know, I, I had to look like them, I guess. But uh, you're looking at a guy that has never tasted beer I have never smoked a cigarette or anything else. And for gosh sakes, no drugs. I, and I'm running around with the biggest drug addict in the country, but that's okay because I had a soldering iron. 
And Paul Klipsch uh, taught me so much. Here's a picture of him with his K-horn, a plexiglass model so you could see it. I was blessed to become a friend and a student of Paul. And um, here's some of the things that you really should take note of because it, it will help you along the way tonight. He referred to the idea factory of Bell Labs and the consolidation of AT&T's and Western Electric. They were the manufacturing arm of the Bell system. They had 4,000 scientists and engineers assigned to a newly created Bell Telephone Lab. And they were fully dedicated to researching how our ears worked and what frequencies, pay attention, what frequencies were most important to understand the spoken word? Here is the reason. They started out putting a pair of wires in, in New Jersey all, all the way across America to California. Well, when they got out there, hmm, it wasn't what they expected. Every 50 miles, Across America, they had a relay station to keep the frequency up, to keep the level up. Everything was fine all the way through. But when they turned the system on, this is what they heard. And they were just absolutely stunned. What happened to our speech articulation? I, they didn't understand it. It's like everything up along all of the uh, relay stations, they were good. So they put these scientists on the case. There were 4,000 of them. Let me get this back where we should be. And this isn't some kind of a thing I put together to make a little show for you. This is a very important piece of science. And I want you to pay attention because it will help your signal when we get through with it. Trust me. Speech articulation, uh, it, it, it's everything in, in any kind of uh, human uh, communication. Bell Labs, they've made a profound discovery of the different audio frequencies that make up the words of the English language. Their discovery prove that two to three K must be elevated in order to make it easy to understand and hear the differences of an F and an S, a P and a B. Speak arti speech articulation is absolutely golden. And let's do that again, right? What you're listening to here is flat. Let's take that two five out. All I did was take 2.5 out on the equalizer. This is a parametric equalizer so I can dial the frequencies that I want. And I'm only doing one control. I'm going from 2.5 to 400, which is usually most everything's around 1,000 if there's no equalization. So listen to the difference of the F and the S, the P and the B, when there's no articulation. And yet when I bring it back up, it's very easy to understand the difference of an F and an S and a P or a B. So what we have to do is think about this when we're talking about our stations. Dr. Fletcher, Dr. Munson also did this. Now, this was very cool. Very, very cool what they did here. They discovered that our ears are not flat. I have once in a while people tell me, oh, I hear great. I hear everything. No, we don't. No. And it depends on the level. You'll notice up at 100 dB, it's almost flat. That's why kids like to listen to music real loud. They hear all the symbols up around 10K, 12K. They hear all of the vocals around 2 to 3K. And they hear all the bass when it's up at 100 dB, but not at the level that we're listening to now. And the most important thing that you should learn tonight is this one. They took that graph, Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson, and they put it in a really cool graph 
about our speech frequencies. They did it for the telephone system, 300 to three, three, uh, uh, 300 out to 3,000. What happened to 2.5? Wow, elevated a lot. I just proved it to you twice. You need to elevate that. And it, it, it just really caught my fancies. Well, I came back into radio in 1980. I sold all of my road system. We'd done just hundreds and hundreds of concerts from leading uh, artists. And it was cool. I became very familiar with so many of these uh, wonderful guys and gals. But I got back to radio. And I said, whoa, I missed it. But what happened to my great Art Collins audio? Holy smokes. I couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe it. Because Collins audio, 20, uh, well, in, uh, it was about 10 years before that. Collins audio was golden. And uh, <laughs> what's the deal? Well, the deal was they had their microphones in their gear coming out of uh, foreign countries, offshore, right? And huh, lo and behold, it was not very articulate. I got on the air one day and I'm hearing this guy. I couldn't understand what he was saying. It was so, yeah, no transient response, no articulation. Hey man, what are you what are you using? Well, I got my new Kenwood and I got my new matching microphone. Really? Matching, huh? Yeah, it's painted the same color, it's matching. Mm -hmm. Well, I started investigating about that matching microphone, only to find out that yep, it was painted the same color. Nope, it didn't sound good. What I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to unplug. We're not paying any attention to the mixer. I do have to set the level up because <laughs> it, it doesn't have near the gain that it should have. Here we go. I'm going to unplug this guy. And I'm going to do this. What happened? We lost all of that brilliance. We lost the transient response. We lost dynamic range. What happened? And don't get away from it. Oh, my God. You got to be right here. Oh, well, shut up, Pyle. Just crank up the gain. Really? Okay. I'll do that. But now what do we got? I got it in my desk stand. Sound like I'm in a roller rink. Hmm. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. Because to me, audio is golden and beautiful and all that. All I'm going to do is change a microphone. Pay attention. Listen. All I did was change the microphone. I'll bring the gain up a little bit for you. And a whole different, a whole different escapade here. It's got better transient response. Articulation is golden. And it really worked well. So what am I going to do, man? What I did was in 1982, I built the first equalizer that amateur radio had ever heard of. And it changed all of amateur radio. I never realized what was going to happen. I just didn't. I, I'm just a guy who loves to build and mess around with stuff. And I did. And I took a pair of the... Uh, uh, filters out of one of those consoles we were building and I put it in a little box battery operated and it had it's two band EQ a bass and a treble no problem but what we have was mic gain have bass and treble but all you had to adjust was plus or minus boost or notch okay It was incredible because I wrote this article for QST and I never realized what was going to happen. I wrote the article and uh, 
it was a DIY. I had all the schematics and layouts that you could build it yourself, but nobody wanted to build it. A few wanted to build it. So we had to put the plant back together because I, I had the plant. It was closed. And I brought back some of my gals that were great solders and away we went. Because you see, voice communications really needs articulation. And I just demonstrated to you, these matching microphones, those companies didn't build those, I found out later. They shipped them off to some OEM com com uh, company in China, usually, and, and it was pretty bad. But, hey, who's matching the came with the radio? What's the matter with you, Heil? No, it wasn't very good. We had to roll off everything under 100 cycles. And I did that in the equalizer itself. You didn't have to equalize it. I did it for you. But what you could do is you could increase things around 160 to 300. And that was really kind of cool. Because all that base stuff, that just eats up with lots of RF energy. Because what you have to look at and listen to is what happens to things with audio. The base does not help you. If I look, if I really, it took away my articulation. I didn't touch 2.5. I didn't touch it. All I did was increase the bass. It's like a teeter totter. If I that bass back down, now listen closely, 2.5 all of a sudden becomes hmm, pleasant. So it was, it was just a, a wonderful thing that equalization came to us. Here's a little demo. You're gonna like this and you're never gonna forget it. Your signal is usually about 3K wide. And replace air with RF. There is where your transmitter is set on the edges. It's all pretty flat because you didn't have an equalizer till the EQ200. But then you could adjust it with some filtering. But when you brought the 2.5 up, look what happened to my signal. Whoa. All of the power I had, 100 watts a kilowatt, 500 watts, 200 watts. It didn't make any difference. If you equalize it and cause 2.5 to be elevated, Where's your RF going? I just proved it to you. It's so easy to understand when it's equalized. So I, I, every once in a while, I still have guys, oh, no, no darn EQ. We all need equalization. And what's even more interesting is that most everything you have in audio, televisions, tape recorders, cell phones they're all pre-equalized for you when the engineers designed those products they elevated that 2.5 a little no you do not have a control but you have to think about hmm where is that rf going what frequency is it going to be just flat yes if you haven't equalized it and what was really wonderful is back in 1999, I got a letter from Dr. Inouye of ICOM. That's Inouye Communications. And he had a picture of his station. And his picture had one of my EQ200s and one of my gold lines. It's like, wow. This is the guy from ICOM. We became very involved with him. He, he wanted me to help him. Not that they couldn't do it, but I was the first guy to bring EQ to the market. He just wanted to get my fix on it. I'm building new transmitter line and I'd like to have your EQ 200. And so from the Pro 1, Pro 2, Pro 3, all the way through their line, to the 7600, 7610, 7300, and if you 
you haven't seen this, they sent this to me to uh, build a headset for it because they don't have a headset. The little 705. Oh, my God. It's a 7300 in one box. Plus, it's got D-Star. It's got Bluetooth. It's amazing. Yeah, it's only five watts, but there are amplifiers if you want to do that. But a lot of guys doing backpacking. Incredible piece. Has my two-band EQ in it. But we also have to think about the microphone. What do you mean, Heil? How do you dress a microphone? I, I, uh, I'm on the air quite a bit, quite a bit. Every morning, by the way, on 3885 on AM, 9 o'clock. But it's important how you address a microphone. A and I hear so many signals on the air. I'd just like to break in and say something I usually don't, unless they ask. Double the distance of your microphone. I don't care what kind it is or where it is. When you double the distance, you should never be, never, 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 ever be more than two inches, ever. And the minute you double that distance, you lose six decibel. Think about this, six decibel. If you double your power, what's that? That's three dB. But we're going to go six dB. Here it goes. I'm not doing anything strange. I'm just putting it like in a desk stand. And I hear guys like this. Well, just turn it up. No, you heard what happened when you turn it up. And you lose your dynamic range. You lose all of your articulation, the transient response. Use it right. And while you're at it, don't forget the windscreen. Why do you have them? You have them because, and people are all different in this, act, in this aspect. We all produce air when we speak out of our mouth. And that air will come down and drive the diaphragm down into the voice coil. And it sometimes causes pops, pee pops, if you speak right into it. But if you used the proper, you know, as I said, proper, windscreen, the pops are gone. However, you want to make sure that it's an acoustically transparent windscreen. You go to Walmart or Radio Shack or on the internet and buy them for a dollar and a half. No, no. I hear guys on the air every once in a while, oh, get rid of that stupid thing. Makes you muffled. No, if it does, get rid of it. Didn't change my audio, did it? No, because it's it's acoustically transparent. And that's that we furnish these with all of our microphones, uh, the ham radio microphones. It's very important. We have to be able to learn to use a microphone. Otherwise, who knows what? Uh, here's some pretty bad signals on the air that could just be much better if they would pay a little attention. <laughs> but uh, the other side of this whole thing that we want to we want to visit is that if you're not equalizing, it's flat. This is the response. We don't want that response. We want it to be flat, huh? No. <laughs> we want it to have that rise in the mid range as Bell Telephone figured it out years ago with those 4,000 scientists. And from that day forward, anybody building audio, audio gear, we know that, so we make it happen. The other thing in uh, RF, if, if, you, if you're not rolling off things, your power on that low end is sucking up a lot of RF. We don't want that. We want it to be focused up in that two to three K and that's so important. And then we came along uh, in about 82, 83, right after the uh, uh, EQ 200 and we build our own microphone elements to do that for you. The HC four and five, they're the darlings of the contest and DXers. It sounds terrible. You listen to me, I build this microphone and it's the worst sounding thing in the world. Why would you build it? Huh, remember this little demo? The, the, uh, <laughs> the elements do it for you automatically. It's so important. 
so important. Today, those elements are called HC7, and uh, they're just they're just absolutely wonderful. And those guys are being used by all kinds of DX contest stations in our Pro 7. The Pro 7 is an amazing product. There's guys out there, companies trying to build these things, but they aren't proper. The guys are building them for airplanes and race cars. They don't know anything about audio. And I tell them to their face, come on, if you're going to build something, you better build it right. This has got Paul Clips written all over it. I've always wanted to do it. Finally got my way when I put this together. What am I talking about? The speaker, which we had to take it outside in free air, find out what the cone resonance was. And then the enclosure, we tune that to that frequency so there's no phase distortion. These things are beautiful sounding. But notice this. The speaker sits right here. It's a good three quarters to an inch from your ear. Now, why did I do that? Prove it to yourself. Take your hands right now and put it up against your ears and listen what happens to your voice. It sounds weird. Of course it does. You need to get a little distance. And so we did it. And they're very soft, comfortable. Some of these uh, the expeditions, I know some uh, two guys, are, they run 24 hours with this. And um, the elements, we have one for ICOM and we have one for everything else because ICOM is very special. We'll get back to that in a minute. One of the things that is really cool about it, it has a left-right balance. So if you have a uh, hearing impairment, you can take care of that. And I put a little jack down here in the corner. So if you have a logger and you're the operator, he can plug his headphone here. You don't need a bunch of Y cords. Last but not least, it's the only headset. And of course, they're all of our headsets for the past 10 years that has phase reversal. And you're going to say, what in the world would you need that for? You need that so that if you're in a pile up and you hear this little wiki back here, reverse the phase and the wiki comes up front. You can change the whole audio spectrum just by changing the phasing of the two speakers. You can move things around in your head acoustically. It is a phenomenon that nobody else has. I don't think they understand it, so good. A, we do and everything we do is paying attention to science. And the last thing, I, I read EHAM almost every day. And once in a while, I see somebody, oh, darn how your head says, it hurt my ears. Didn't read the instructions, did you, sir? Every one of all my headsets has a steel band inside the headband. So if you have a little larger head than me, don't be afraid. And then if you have a pinhead like me, <laughs> adjust it. You're not going to hurt it. You're not going to break it. But so much of this is just, it's just really, really important. And then uh, 2006, uh, Sarah and I had a, a home in uh, California because we were working with Joe and a lot of the people in the studios that, uh, of our clients sitting in Joe's kitchen one day and he said, Heil, you got to build me a better microphone. What do you mean? Well, thing is that I got to just be stuck right here and you've seen them. They're all right here. They can't move all these artists. Uh, I want to move around a little and I don't want to hear all these guys behind me. So get rid of it. He said, remember that big antenna you had? When I come through there, we get on two meters. When you turn that around, I couldn't hear you. That was amazing. Do that to my microphone. Okay. I did. How did I do it? Well, it was all about phasing, my favorite subject. In the next 15 minutes, you're not going to believe some of the things we're going to let you hear. First of all, there's the microphone. Everybody else, every company, I don't care if it's $4,000 or $42. They have four little holes around the edge of the uh, of the element. Six o'clock, 
9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. That's the only entrance for the rear rejection audio because that's going to be out of phase. Well, I said, no. First of all, it's not a little three-quarter inch thing like all the others. And I mean microphones that are uh, $4,000. What a joke. We were the first company and only that I know of today building large diaphragm dynamics. And I opened up the whole bottom of this thing so that the element gets the information 360 degrees sitting on top of what I call a collection tube. The microphone has become the darling of the broadcast industry, the PR40. This is a red one. <laughs> we have, we have a, uh, a shop that does all of our custom work in house and we can do all kinds of stuff for you. But anyway, that's how it works. And the element is on top, of course. I'm going to unplug this, not playing the games here. And here's the PR40. <laughs> I, better, I better roll it down a little. It's got a lot of output. Because I built this for the broadcast industry. Never thought about ending up in the, in the amateur radio, but it is. It's very popular. But notice I can be anywhere around for 180 degrees and it didn't change. You try that with any microphone. You know what will happen. It's great here. But here it comes. Be sure you watch this if you kind of sleeping. Wake up because this is a biggie. This microphone, the way I just described, has 40 dB, 40 dB of rear rejection. And here we go. It's gone. Oh, the mic still works, but it's 40 dB down. No other microphone in the, in the world does that. N not at 40 dB. How did I do it? Because of ham radio. And, and that's the thing that really, really, it really bugs me. Why we don't hear more things of this nature. But there again, a, a lot of people are doing these things. And <laughs> I, I don't know who they're building them for. But um, I, I just love phasing. I'm going to bring you something here that I think you're going to very much enjoy. Because we, uh, as I said, I just love phasing. And I always wanted to, to build a phased array. Well, first of all, you know how many thousand dollars that's going to cost, and I'm going to forget it. A few years ago, we bought a second home down in the Ozarks, and uh, it was five and a half acres. Wow! I think I can. I think I can get my uh, my phased array up, and so I did. I went out to the uh, home company. And they had, they had poles, they had big poles, and they were cut off, they had like 100 foot and they got broken or whatever. And they were like 60 foot, 50 foot, so I got them. Guess what? For nothing. So we get into building a phased array. I want you to check this out. It is phenomenal the next couple of minutes. This is all live. We have just completed the installation of a 75 meter phased array antenna system consisting of a pair of coaxial dipoles mounted atop a pair of 55 foot telephone poles. We put them in an inverted V fashion and the poles are 64 foot apart. These are 500 foot from the operating position fed with RG213. In order to make the antennas directive from east to west, we use a delay line of 43 foot here on 75 meters that's switched in and out of the driven element, either east or west. The down lead length is 126 foot. We take all of that coax, the down lead length, the 43 foot phasing delay line, and mounted them 
in a container, one of the plastic container boxes that we actually buried. And just the top of it shows. It's all sealed, so it's waterproof. But that's the way we get to switch all the components from 500 foot using one of the Amatron RCS 8V remote switches. It really works well. Take a listen to how we can get at least 10 to 20 dB difference east to west. Like a lot of people do, I, mine's usually three inches or so, it, you know, that's just after I get done mowing it. And uh, I know, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, we get a dry day. I'm I'm going to have to lay out there and mow. That's just all there is to it because, you know, if you leave it that high, when it starts growing in it all, it gets looking, ra it gets looking ragged pretty quick. So uh, it's, uh, it's to that point now. And uh, the system really performs on weak signals. Take a listen as we switch to the direction they're coming from. Also note, the preamplifier makes no difference on 75 meters on this signal. The preamplifier, of course, make the meter read higher. But in many cases, the preamplifier does not cause the weak signal to be more readable. Check it out. Yeah, well, I see they introduced big display on it, and... Uh... Here's some great sounding AM stations, and we were getting about 20 dB front to back. I don't think I have to uh, explain further. <laughs> it's amazing. I really put it up because I wanted to talk to my West Coast friends on AM. I, I, I work a lot of AM. So how are you going to do that on 75 meters? I just proved it to you. It was really just simply amazing. The cost, well, I had the relays. That wasn't a big deal. And um, had two dipoles. All I needed was the phasing line. That's 46 foot of RG8. Good grief. What's that cost me? Didn't have to buy it. Had a bunch. So it isn't thousands of dollars like I thought, because you hear these guys and they're phase this and phase that. I'm just a, a nut for phasing because it affects everything we do. How did Dr. Yagi design the, uh, uh, design the Yagi antenna? How'd he do that? Didn't have a computer. I was modeling. Don't get me started on that. Um, <laughs> He figured out if he had a driven element on a boom and he went out so far, so long, he could get gain. Do one in front of it, he'd get more gain. But if he made one a little longer and a certain distance behind, he could get, aha, he could get a signal reduction. Mm -hmm. And that's how it happened. It's all about phasing. And, and, all of my microphones, we pay a lot of attention to phasing because there are things we can do with it to make it sound better. And uh, I, I'm really very, very happy about some of the things that have happened with our stuff. The BR-40, I didn't design it initially for any of the uh, ham radio, although it's become a very popular microphone. I built it for recording studios. Uh, so you know there's there's just a lot of things that that happen that you don't you don't figure Sirius radio just bought 250 of them got rid of all their re20s it's all about ham radio i get that all the time oh man i get these guys going well you know where did you graduate from i didn't i hardly made it through high school i was busy making money playing the theater organ and i'll answer them uh ham radio no 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 where did you get your education i said ham radio no man you don't understand i said no you don't understand i learned it from ham radio years of it 
coming up on 65 for me. But there's just something about people that don't take it seriously when you say this, but they have to because, my goodness, a lot of things happen because of hams, isn't it? Well, one of the other things that really bugs me is the manufacturers do not write very good instructions. And their DSP setups, it depends on your voice, that's for sure. The microphone is very important, and it's not the matching microphone. It's not even built by them. How do I know that? Because I work for them. <laughs> I did the, uh, the equalizer for Dr. Uh, Dr. Inouye. And uh, the next year, Dr. Hasegawa, who owns uh, Yesu, come to me. I want to do it better. Uh, okay. I could do a parametric. Yeah, that'd be good. I said, uh-huh. You might have some real problems. What be the problem? Education. Well, that won't be all they do. Well, yes, it will. Because with a regular little two-band equalizer, Nothing wrong with that if the filters are at the right frequencies. And I chose those frequencies very, very important based on the couple of years on ham radio, knowing where to place them. 160 on the low end. You can plus or minus it. That's all you can do. You can't move it. And the top end, where is it? Of course it is. You already know. 2.5K plus or minus. But parametric... If you have a Yesu or anything with parametrics, you're going to love the next couple of minutes because I'm going to teach you how to do it. I could take a 10-year-old kid that knows nothing about electronics and teach him how to do it. Here it is. Here's what I'm talking about. There are three filters in the Yesu. Three. Each one of them can do the bandwidth, the frequency, and plus or minus. Uh, there are three filters. Uh, instead of two controls, you have nine, nine. And so the majority of guys will completely forget it and use their radio the way it came in the box, default. How sad. Here we go. You're going you're gonna to love this. If you got a Yesu, going to take the first filter. First of all, you set the frequency. Where are we going to do that? See, there's the problem people have. They're not quite sure where to set it. Well, there's uh, 50 pages on our website. <laughs> and you go in there and I'll show you where. But it's 160 on the low end. It's that first frequency. Bandwidth, how, how wide do you want it? You want it to reach out an octave or two? I usually just do one octave and we're happy. The third one, booster cut. You're going to notch, you're going to notch out that 160 a little bit because you don't want all that low end. I mean, we're notching out a lot of it just because of where the frequency is. But now you're going to go to the second filter. One octave, set it at about 900 to maybe 1200. You got to kind of listen to that one, but just set it for 900 because it's kind of a boxy sound there. I don't care what it is, just the way the human ears hear that. So we're going to set it at 900, and what are we going to do with it? Cut it. So one octave, 900, cut a little bit. Okay, you're probably ahead of me. You're probably ahead. Where's the third one going to be? 2.5K, one octave, and we're going to crank it up. Oh, was that difficult? And the other thing that all of them need, you got to really pay attention to this, is transmitter bandwidth. You want to be careful about that because that's very important. I usually set it at around 3K and that's it. These guys are doing these things at 5 and 6K to wipe out three or four stations around them. That's not fair. It's not moral. This is ham radio. You don't need to have that. But anyway, that's how you do that. And um, other things like RF gain, a lot of guys don't realize the importance of RF gain. You don't want to leave it open. And here's the reason. Mostly just uh, involved in right turn on uh, the two meter net and uh, the uh, 40 and 80 meter nets. And that's pretty well the turn on when 
to I was used to be on package. Yeah, but uh, I I don't enjoy the computer part of the uh to get into the uh, running the computers at all like we used to. So um, I don't really have much to tell you on your question. You lower that RF gain and some of the noise goes away. And along with that, you adjust the AGC. This is very compelling. It just kind of got forgotten. And uh, somebody like Bob or anybody else would uh, say, I wonder about this old uh, stuff that we used to do and uh, apply it to a new... Uh, application and it works great you know so that's very good i love the technical uh, abilities that come along with this uh, hobby the um the technician if you uh, use fast agc pumps and uh, i like that part too so very good comments and you, you can get these things to sound beautiful if you just adjust them but the problem is that a lot of guys don't they're kind of scared that's that's my biggest deal is a lot of guys they they get afraid well, we don't want to be afraid we want to make things happen we want to make them happen right one of the other things that really bugged me working for these companies i mean i learned so much on the other side of the fence if you know what i mean but I could never get them to do certain things. Dr. Hasegawa did it right with the, the first big rig of his, which was a 9,000. It was very expensive, but it was incredible. It had a balanced line, XLR input, like all the broadcast stations. Why do we use that in the broadcast? Because it's balanced. Why would we want balanced? Hmm. Because this is very important. One of the leads is plus and one is minus. Really? Okay. What does that mean, Heil? That means if there's any noise that ends up on your mic line, it cancels. Really? Mm -hmm. So we can get cancellation of that noise just by using a balance line input. Really? Yes. If you haven't learned anything yet, I'll guarantee you this is going to be hot and going crazy on the repeaters tomorrow. You'll never forget gonna get this. I'm just going to unplug this. By the way, this was a microphone. We built two of these. Uh, one for Charlie Daniels, the late Charlie. What a great American. And my, my custom guys built this for him. He's really great. I said, why do you do that? Build me one in that special he was a very good friend and uh, about uh, we were with him for 12 years everything was higher hours on that stage so here we go i have two microphones and believe it or not they're alike <laughs> Wait a minute, Isle. <laughs> Different color. Told you we had a custom shop. PR 22 is a microphone that I built for Paul Rogers at his request. So I'm getting tired of my mixers out in front of the hall. They didn't know what I'm doing and what they're doing. I just want a microphone that's very articulate. They can plug it in and don't EQ it. PR 22. It's great. Two of them. And they're both absolutely alike. Now, I've got a little sidestep here. If you were running 500 watts and you weren't making the pileups because you didn't have good articulation with the right microphone and the right adjustment, I'm going to buy a kilowatt. Okay, you're going to buy a kilowatt. Okay. So you just spent $2,000 of your wife's money. <laughs> really? Well, what happens? Hmm. If you don't have any articulation, it really didn't do you any good. But you only gained, you doubled your power from 500 to 1,000, right? Well, um, how much did you gain? Three decibel. This is the science. This isn't Bob Heil making things up. This night is all about 
science, everything I talk about. Well, if I talk into these microphones and I bring them both together, the meter on my mixer is going to go up. It's going to go up 3 dB. Let me get that set. You ready? See if you can hear. Listen hard. One, two, three. Wait a minute. Close your eyes. You know, listening is so important. There we go. One, two, three. Let me do that again. Here's both of them. I'm going to take one away. This could be $2,000. Here we go. I'm going to take it away. One, two, three. Sorry. The human ear cannot detect three decibel. Oh, we were in some million dollar ant echo chamber. Yeah, maybe, but no, not going to happen. Here's where I really want to do. While I'm here, it was always fun to do that. By the way, you can get a good 10 dB or more. 10 dB, not 3 by proper equalization and the proper microphone. So take that $2,000, give it to your wife, and she can go buy some shoes and purses, okay? That'll do a whole lot more than that little 3 dB. Sure, that's a good stuff. This All right, I built this little plug, and that little plug is backwards. Two is hooked to three, and three is hooked to two. It's out of phase. Big deal, out. big deal. Still works just fine. Yeah, but listen what happens when I'm going to talk in both of them. This one, when I talk in it, the diaphragm goes down. This one, it comes up. What do they do together? Zero. No. They do not work, but together, they don't work. It's all about phasing. I'm telling you, let's come back some night and I'll spend the whole night on phasing. It's my favorite, favorite subject. I love it because it affects everything we do. Let me unplug this. Everything we do. Your noise blanker, how's that work? It takes that noise out of phase. How does your notch filter? Some idiot comes on top of your frequency and doesn't care. What do you do? Hit the notch filter. How to get rid of him? Takes him out of phase. See you later. And so, you know, the, 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 we went through the, an, the antennas and all that. It just doesn't make sense why the manufacturers will not help us, but they don't seem to care. What we do you go to our page, heilsound.com. There's about 50 pages, all things ICOM, all things Yesu, all things Elecraft, Kenwood, so on. I'm constantly updating those, so you want to pay attention because we can help you. And if that doesn't work, call me. Send me an email. I get a lot of emails every day. And I love to help people. I really do. And I'm really glad to help any of you anytime. I want to close with my wonderful new little system that I built a couple of years ago. I thought, man, we got to do something about receive because receive is just a joke. What are you talking about, Heil? And even the companies I, I work for, they, they don't care. All they think about is one thing, sensitivity, selectivity, isn't it? What about your audio? That's why you have never, ever seen a spec sheet on audio, equal, or audio output because all of these receivers, I don't care if it's 15,000 or 200, they all have one watt, maybe two, at 10% distortion. That's ridiculous. So what I did is I designed what we call the parametric receive system. And there has never been anything like it. And I'm so happy that it's helping so many people. A lot of guys that are hard of hearing and so on. I have a digital tape that I did off air. And 
now I'm going to play this for you. Okay, there we go. What we're going to do is it's not the same as a rig built, you know, just there's a here's a couple of sideband stations. You know, they, the receivers will never never compare. Uh, That's so the way you hear him. Yeah, again, ICOM technology. There's another one. It's flat. This is the way you hear this signal. Let me increase the gain a little bit. But I was basically starting at the bottom. No articulation. Oh, yes, there is. 20 years in the, in the Navy or whatever. The There's the way you hear him. And retire. People say, well, you got it made. And then no, you got guys you running a D-104. It's all highs. No low end. So we're going to change that. At about 30 words a minute, and so Make a real I speeded up of the it. tape, and sure enough, I can copy it. I had a gun lost on the other There's night. There's the way you hear him. I thought, well, I wonder if I can copy that. And balance it out. Balance balance is so important. Oh, my gosh. It is so important. Here comes the good stuff. This is a DX station. Echo India is Bravo, Lima Bravo, BIS. So where you were in? In this flat. In this flat, the way you were in. Hello, teachers, 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 funding, teachers, teachers, funding, teachers. I don't think I have to say more. It, it, it's, it's just wonderful. And one of the things that I did for it, I have two headphone amps. One of them could be used for a logger. The other could be used for the operator. Or, and this is the thing that really is getting some attention, you can put the left side in one and the right side in the other and adjust the level of each. So many things. It's a wonderful thing. There's another output, and that output is for record. So if, that's how I made those recordings. All you have to do is dial her up. Away you go. Plug it into Audacity or whatever, and you're there. So, you know, we're, we're just constantly thinking of, of things to do, products to bring to you. And last but not least, I mean, wish we had more and more time. I could be here for hours, but I want to show you about your connectors. They are a living joke. They're all foster connectors from the CB days of 1962, and they haven't changed. Well, we changed it. The little ring on it, you got to have a uh, needle nose to get it into some of these inputs. That one's an, almost a half inch. It's beautiful. But the connector is very stealth. And the cable clamp actually is designed to work with our cable. So you don't have a bunch of, uh, of tape wrapped around it or heat, heat, uh, heat shrink from the manufacturers. So look at your mic when you get home. I designed my own wiring to do that. By the way, that other little guy, that's where you push to talk. We, we designed some really great wire. We sell tens of thousands of feet of this stuff. It, first of all, it's very supple. It's very, very soft. It's got a 100% silver shield. And when you start picking it apart, you don't end up with three little strands like everybody else. Two 18 gauge, huge. Every other cable is about 26 gauge. Two of them, so you can have balanced line. And here's the important thing I solve more RFI problems just by changing a guy's cable. The blue and the red are DC push to talk, but it's outside of the shield, it's not inside where the sensitive audio is. And uh, there again, I. This is, yeah, it's my ham radio station, but I got to tell you, it's my lab. It, it's where I play with all this stuff and design it. As I told you, you're right in the middle of this project right now, uh, getting a headphone uh, to work on the 705. About, oh, it's been about six years ago. I was incre incredibly blessed. I uh, received a PhD from Mizzou University. I hardly made it through high school. I said, wow, what's the deal? 
I said, yeah, but it took you 50 years to get this. And I was very, very thrilled by that. It's because we, as I said, I, didn't, I, I really never was a great student, but I am in this stuff because I'm playing with it all day. Last but not least, we're the only manufacturer in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I didn't have time to get into some of this tonight, but there's a ton of history about everybody from Carrie Underwood to Charlie Daniels to Joe Walsh to, uh, the, you know, just it goes on and on and on. Uh, the first thing we did years back was uh, help the Grateful Dead. So we're very, very blessed that we're into ham radio because that's, that's where it started for me. Do you have any questions we can go through quickly? We do have just a couple of minutes. Anybody, uh, anybody online with any questions first? Don't be shy. How about anybody in house here? No, Online, I, I got a question. Oh, there we go. Go ahead. Go ahead, Marshall. Hi. Uh, well, Bob, appreciate the presentation. Uh, you, you talk about making all these adjustments, but is there a way to see what adjustments you make? Other way than to... other people hearing it. Well, uh, listen, have you, do you, what kind of transmitter you got? I got a Kenwood TS480. What? Unfortunately, the 480 is kind of a little lone wolf of its own. It was made really for portable and mobile use. What really is kind of sad, it only has 2.4 filters. So you can't get nice, beautiful, deep, rich, articulate audio. You can get articulation, but it's real pinched up because the filters are all only allow 2.4 through it. And so you can't, you can't get it. Oh, you can say it sounds great for our just communications, but you're probably comparing it to like any of the ICOMs or an 890 or, you know, uh, even if, you know, some of the other uh, Kenwoods that's, but you don't have any equalization in it because they figured it was a waste. I know I work for these guys and I, you guys really missed the boat there, but it's a fun rig. I have two of them. And they're great to put in a mobile, but uh, and they work beautifully as remotes. But um, the only way to do any of this, the answer to that is clear. Listen in another receiver, put a dummy load on your transmitter, take another receiver, pair of headphones, and dial up what you have. That, that's really the way to figure out what you sound like. Thank you. I know it's not what you wanted to hear, but I, I can't lie to you and I can't paint a rosy picture, but don't misunderstand. It's a great transceiver for uh, mobile and articulation is, is pretty much there, but it, I just can't get any big full range out of it, but it's great. It's got a good receiver. Okay. It is. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody in house? No, Bob. I, I I know you've got a you've got a run, um, I but yeah. I wanted to, <laughs> or at least that's that's what I saw in the email. Yeah. Um, we're we're doing two and three clubs a day. Oh Lord, ninety of them since April. I just because I love to share this, and you only got this much of it. We'll come back and pick out one subject and spend some time on it. But man, I I think you probably learn from this tonight you don't hear this stuff and it's all so important so that's why i love coming to the clubs and helping well, we we thank you very much for for joining us i'm i mean it, not the audio the thing that caught my eye was the phased array that you had on 80 <laughs> meters that's that's i see jason shaking his head yes we've got a we've got a club shack we're building and we've got a perfect opportunity out there that we might be able yeah. to uh to do something like that. So I'm excited yeah. about that. One of the things I did, uh, you see all these switches? These are Les Paul guitar switches. You can buy them from Antique Electronic Supply. They're not expensive. But instead of a rotary switch on your, uh, on your relay systems, 
that's an, a Meritron uh, uh, switch. It has a little box, you know. Wow. That's not good when you're having to, but boy, I replaced that with those. I got another one. I don't know. You can, that, the first uh, four select the transceivers. The second determine the bands. And this is what the phased array is. Really cool stuff. So let me hear from you. We'll come do that some night. That'd be fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, okay. I think we, we've got the, the polls are already there. <laughs> okay. So, well, a lot of the work I think is already already yeah. done. We got a gentleman sitting right back here that's got his ladder. He's ready to go out and climb the poles tonight. You got it. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate uh, letting me come by. Let's do it again. And any questions, please email me. Don't be shy. K nine EID at A double R L works. And visit the website. My QR pay and QRZ page has got a lot of stuff on it too. Hell, we'll see you next time. Uh, be safe. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. And we'll we'll go on into our business meeting then. Okay, there Th you go. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful evening. Thanks, guys and girls. Bye-bye for now. Bravo.